Sharon Isbin, and you're watching Guitar TV. Well, I started actually by default, where our family moved to Italy when I was nine years old. My father's a scientist, he was invited to do some consulting work there, and my older brother said he wanted guitar lessons. His fantasy was to be the next Elvis Presley. So when my parents found the teacher, who was actually quite famous in Italy, had studied with Segovia, was touring, brought my brother for the interview, he saw that he'd have to grow his fingernails long in the right hand and practice classical guitar, he said, oh no, this is not what I had in mind. So I volunteered to take his place, and that's what happened. At nine I began my lessons, and this was in Varese where we lived for a year. When we returned to uh, Minneapolis, which is where I grew up, that's when I began to work with a teacher locally, Jeffrey Van. And by the time I was 16, I was really on my own, and I was using a mirror and a tape recorder, and I would have lessons from time to time with Andre Segovia, with Julian Bream, and then I began studying with Oscar Gilia in the summertime at the Aspen Music Festival. Now, who would have imagined then, but I now head the program at the Aspen Music Festival, which is mid-July to mid-August every summer. And then I went to Yale University, but in between all of that, I began to do student competitions in Minneapolis, and my turning point was really when I was 14. At that point, I was determined to be a rocket scientist, and I would spend all my time building and launching model rockets and sending worms and grasshoppers up into space. But I won a competition, and the award was to play with the Minnesota Orchestra, do a, a solo piece with them. And I walked out in front of 5,000 people in the audience, and I thought, you know what? This is even more exciting than setting my insects up in the space. I'm switching gears. So from that moment on, I decided to become a guitarist. When I started studying in Aspen, I really learned how to use my fingernails, because we don't use a pick. It's how you play in terms of the angle of the finger. So for example, if I'm in one place, I can make that warmer by just doing an angle, or, and if you combine the left hand, you can get all kinds of different sounds. So the amount of flesh versus nail alone, perpendicular, is what, what's going to get you your clearest sounds. So if I'm playing something really fast, for example, if I'm uh, if I'm doing something that requires total articulation, you need the nail. You need the nail to make that very clear, or a tremolo, same idea. something that's very lyrical, uh, a melodic line, I want it to sound very rounded. So for example, uh, the Rodrigo uh, opening tune of the slow movement.
one of the techniques I'm using is not only right hand, but I'm actually creating a vibrato with the left hand by adding several fingers at the same time. So for example, if I do this, then I add another finger, and another finger, and another finger, the vibrato keeps getting more and more intense. So if you translate that here, suddenly I have three fingers. If I just did this, it doesn't have the soul. That has soul. The other thing I'm doing that adds that vocal quality is the sound in between notes. If I just did this, or if I did this, it's very box-like square, not very interesting. So these are what we would simply call nuances to make the, the meal much more appetizing. It's just the spices that you add to make it something very compelling and very beautiful. string can't hear the same sound that has soul so that's why the fingering that you choose that little portamento there between the notes that's the cry of the voice same thing for example uh, in Asturias So the secret really to making the guitar sound lyrical, like a voice, is being able to create the sounds in between the notes and to shape them so that everything has a contour, just like you would if you're looking at objects in three dimensions. This is another example from um, La Catedral by Agustin Barrios Mangore and like Asturias and the Rodrigo, it's, it's on the Guitar Passion CD and this is the one that has the introduction here. Here's a, a, a section for example. For example, did this. Be boring, but here. That is feeling. But that feeling is not only from within you, it's how you are able to create the shape, the contour, and the connection between the notes. I wanted to get a good education for four years and stayed another year to get a master's. And during that time, I began working uh, with Rosalind Turk, who is a great Bach scholar and keyboard artist. And with her, I studied Baroque performance practice. What does that mean? It's the trills, the embellishments, the articulation, the phrasing, dynamics, and understanding the structure of what goes into playing Baroque music. So, that was really a remarkable experience. For example, if I were demonstrating um, Vivaldi. So if that were the first time playing, no embellishment. So if I were demonstrating, for example, how to, to vary that, with the improvisational quality that was typical of the Baroque period, actually 
Bach was the jazz of his time, Vivaldi was the jazz of his time. So the performers knew how to improvise uh, when they did the variations. So the repeat of that simple tune would be in, in my adding embellishment, which is my own voice here. structure, something that is unique to the performer, but that actually gives the piece its life. So another place in the Vivaldi, for example, if I were doing it the first time, without adding any, any what we call embellishment, it would sound like this. So if I add the embellishment in the repeat, here's an idea of how it might sound. taking you know compositions and you're you're adding your own voice to them and creating something and you know my understanding of that personally is that you know a lot of people in the classical world don't do that mm -hmm. and so this is very unique to you so maybe we could talk about that and capture that um, you know so maybe just tell us a little bit about the creation of, of these pieces one of the, the first uh, big contracts I signed was with EMI Virgin Classics and the first album that I did for them was all the Bach boot suites. So that was, that was a, a huge thing, and it reflected the 10 years of study that I did with the keyboard artist and Bach scholar, Rothland Turk. So if you listen to that, you listen to the repeats, you'll hear that sense of improvisation in the style of, of the Baroque time. So you're talking about uh, 17th and 18th century. It's important that we put things into context because you, you wouldn't be walking around right now in Shakespeare's clothes unless you were in a play. But if you are in the play, you have to know how to speak in that language of that time, similarly when you're playing Bach or Baroque music. So I think one of the reasons I'm really drawn to working with jazz guitarists, rock guitarists, great artists like Steve I and uh, Steve Morris, and Stanley Jordan, is that they improvise, that's what they do as how they breathe the air that they, they are to exist, they improvise. And that quality is something that really attracts me because it has a freshness to it. And it is something that does come from the classical tradition, where the composer and the performer were one, whether you were Mozart or you were Bach or you were Beethoven or Chopin, you sat at whatever your instrument was, created the music and performed it. So as a classical artist, that coming from that tradition, I think that I'm, I'm very drawn to recapturing that spirit when I work with these great artists from the other genres. I made a number of recordings with EMI, starting with the Bach Lute Suites, then the Rodrigo Concerto with uh, the Concerto de Aranjuez and the Fantasia para un gentil hombre, with the Lausanne Chamber Orchestra and Vivaldi at that time as well. I did uh, an album of contemporary American music called Nightshade Rounds. I did an album with uh, Benita Valente and Thomas Allen, Love Songs and Lullabies. Road to the Sun, which was Latin romances. 
uh, a lot of fun Spanish and Latin American music. And eventually, I switched and went to, to uh, Warner Classics. And my first album with, with them was quite, quite fun because it was called Journey to the Amazon. And it reflected my passion really for the Amazon rainforest. I had already visited uh, in Costa Rica and in Ecuador. I went to the Galapagos uh, and the rainforest there and eventually to the Brazilian Amazon. And I was fascinated by the sounds, the animals, the, 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 the beautiful views. It was like going back to the Garden of Eden. You'd see toucans and boa constrictors and, and all kinds of extraordinary animals uh, in the wild, that, and the monkeys, of course, and the piranhas in the water. Um, this was, to me, really going back to the origins of life. And when I returned from my first trip, I met Gaudenzo Tiago de Mello, who is a percussionist, organic percussionist, actually, and composer from a, a tribe in the Amazon called the Maue. And we began a collaboration that has lasted for over 25 years. And he composes for me, we play his music, we did an album called Journey to the Amazon with Paul Winter, soprano saxophone from the Paul Winter Consort as a guest. And it was music from the countries in South America that border the Amazon and the tributaries. And very, very exciting to, to make. So, I actually invited Paul and Tiago to join me again on Guitar Passions, the new CD with Sony. And after a number of records with uh, Warner, I then signed with Sony and did in 2009 an album called Journey to the New World, which was an exploration of folk music starting in the 16th century with duets that I do with myself from the British Isles and then moving through the 17th and 18th century Scotland and Ireland, crossing the ocean with the immigrants, their dreams, their hopes, their passions, their music, to what became, in the new world, the beginning of our folk music. And to aid me in this journey, I invited two guests, one of whom was Mark O'Connor on Country Fiddle in a suite, which is a folk suite that he wrote for the two of us, and Joan Baez. I had actually premiered in this album a solo suite called the Joan Baez Suite, and when she heard it, she offered to sing on the album. So she joined me in Wayfaring Stranger and Go Away From My Window. Very exciting, because she's my, my folk music idol. Along the way, uh, there have been a, a three Grammy recordings that have uh, received that accolade, uh, one of which was Dreams of a World, an album I did for, for Teldec, uh, Warner Classics, that was all folk-inspired music for solo guitar from eight different countries. And that uh, was then followed by, uh, the following year, a concerto disc I did with two works written for me by Tan Dun, the composer from China of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Christopher Rouse. And the Rouse won a Grammy for classical composition, so that was exciting as a work for guitar and orchestra. And then, most recently, the album uh, Journey to the New World received in 2010 uh, a Grammy. The concept of Guitar Passions was not only to pay tribute to the guitar, but also to my guitar heroes and the people who have either been my mentors or those who are artists I just tremendously admire. So from the past, we have Andre Segovia, with whom I, I had lessons, and I chose to honor his contribution to the guitar world by selecting a work that he made famous as one of his most famous transcriptions, and that was Asturias Valvenis. <laughs> but he adapted it in such a way as to capture clearly what was the inspiration of guitar for the composer Isaac Albanese and make it into a work that now people associate really with this instrument. I also wanted to honor my good friend, the late Brazilian guitarist Laurindo Almeida. He was instrumental in bringing bossa nova to the West. And we had a trio for five years with Larry Coriel called Guitar Jam. And the piece that actually brought us together was the Rodrigo, which he arranged.
guitars. And by arranging it for three guitars, he decided to take it one step further, which was to combine the jazz world, the classical world, and the Latin bossa nova. So at the very end, instead of the orchestral solo, for example, there is a bossa nova improv with electric guitar. So in this version that I do, uh, from the, the work that Lorindo had written for us, I have Steve Morse rocking out in the most amazing way, and Romero Lubambo and I are doing the bossa nova chords, and I encourage Romero, to, who is taking Lorindo's part, to improvise in a jazz style the part that he plays, which is from the English horn, and I'm doing what Rodrigo wrote, including the two cadenzas. So it's a real fusion of these different worlds coming together and uniting in one voice. And that is the centerpiece of, of Guitar Passions. And then I asked Stanley Jordan to join me. I had done a tour with him back in 1998. And at that time, we had a great time playing together. Of course, he's an innovator of the tapping technique on electric guitar. So I chose a work by an Argentinian composer, Sinesi, played that part and had Stanley improvise his own on top of that, which was really uh, a very brilliant con conception that he did in creating his part. I invited um, Nancy Wilson from Hart and together we did a new rendition of Dreamboat Annie, which was one of my favorite songs from her early albums. And we did, we both played guitar, she sang, and we did some improvisation. It was really a lot of fun to put that together. Rosa Passos from Brazil, a wonderful singer-songwriter, and Paul Winter and Tiago de Mello. And of course, Steve Vai, who has been my great, great friend for many years now. And we have quite a history. We, we met doing a Recording Academy event and hit it off, playing together and as friends. He's like a brother to me. Uh, when I was in Paris in a few years ago in 2005, I was asked to commission a composer to write for me and I asked Steve if he would write something for the two of us and he created this amazing suite called the Blossom Suite, which we premiered there. Just the two of us, he's playing electric guitar and playing acoustic amplified. And this is a project we hope to record at some point soon. And when Guitar Passions came up, again, it was one of those chance things. I was hanging out with him at his house. We were filming for a documentary on me that's, that's uh, being completed now, on my life and my work. And I just started playing this. started improvising to it. And that's how the Allegro was born. This is uh, what you just heard now by Agustin Barrios from Paraguay. And in fact, if you want to see what you can do, if you want to be Steve Vai, on Guitar Passions, I also do a solo version of that. And you can experiment, improvise, and see what you come up with. What Steve did on electric guitar had that beautiful lyricism that is so much a part of him. And that sense of drama and dynamics very, very beautiful. So Guitar Passions was released on August 30th, 2011. And you can hear clips of it by going to my website, SharonHisbin.com. You can get it on iTunes, on Amazon, um, in stores, if you can find any stores anymore. And it's being sold worldwide, all, all over the, uh, the world. It's fantastic. And um, well, let's ask, let's ask a question about, um, well, you studied all these amazing places with uh, influential teachers and accomplished professors of the instrument and music. Um, you know, um, I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but, you know, being female, what was that like to be, you know, in, in a class and in studies with all these, you know? Well, it's really interesting yeah. when you look at how few women have been involved in classical guitar. And I think one of the reasons for that is that at the time when I was growing up, the role models were men. And that is changing now. 
I think that the tradition in the United States tends to come more from the rock world. If you're a 13-year-old fellow and you're playing rock guitar and you hear a, an album of classical music, you think, oh, that's cool, let's see what that's like. But how many girls were playing rock guitar at that time, or even now for that matter? So I would show up, for example, at the Aspen Music Festival. There was one summer when I was a student, as a teenager, and there were 50 guitar students, 50 classical guitar students. Only two of us were girls. So what that did was it, it inspired me to work even harder because I had to actually defend both the instrument in the world that was still hostile to classical guitar at that time and gender and really be able to compete on all levels. And that was, for me, a, a really great motivation. Fantastic. And, and since that time, have you seen the evolution of, have you seen now more women uh, uh, taking interest in classical guitar as your journey goes? I find that the number of women studying guitar in the United States hasn't changed all that much. I, I've been heading the guitar department, which I created at the Juilliard School in 1989. And during that time, all the female guitarists that I've had, which really I can count on the fingers of certainly no more than two hands, have been from outside of the United States, from Europe and, and the Middle East, whereas uh, all my American students have been still men. In Europe it's a little different because there's, there's a tradition that goes back certainly farther, but also that has had some female figures. So I think it'll, it'll continue to change eventually, little by little. is that you play on the fingertips and there's a, a sense of arching. And I noticed that a, a number of rock players adopt that if they've studied classical because it helps them even move around uh, with more dexterity and, and accuracy. So if you, were, if you were trying to figure out, for example, the ideal left hand position, I do what's called the gorilla grip. I just let my arm hang loose like this and I pretend I'm back in the, the jungle and I have to be a big ape and hold on to the tree limb. By doing this, in this very spontaneous gesture, you'll, you'll find that the grip is like this, and then just by easing that into position, that's really what ends up being your perfect hand position. And the thumb is generally between the first and second fingers and touching the neck on the side here. That prevents this problem, which would create an elongation of the fourth finger and you won't be able to use it very well. But if you bring it in and keep it rounded, that's your ideal technique. So you can do all kinds of different exercises, create, create the lightness that you want, and on different strings. So that kind of dexterity comes in handy when you're doing pieces as well. I practice in the right hand uh, scales and try to get the dexterity that I need for that. So for example, if I'm doing with these two fingers or I and A or A and I, um, if I'm trying to get the coordination um, just trying to get the flow of the coordination of the two hands. And of course, to get to that speed, I would practice very slowly, work it up gradually with a metronome. The whole idea in vibrato, of course, is to be able to change the pitch, but to do it in such a way that uh, it is subtle. So you don't want this, unless you're doing a special technique. Uh, and contemporary music, but you want it to be fast and I find that by adding more fingers I can enrich and enhance that vibrato because more fingers are being able to move the string up and down. So this instrument is made by Tony Mueller from Germany and what's special about it, not only that it has a great sound, warm, clear, fast response, is that it has a double top. So it's a sandwich double top with cedar. 
And by being able to do that, he reinforces the wood that he can choose in a very thin dimension. And that thinness uh, allows the sound to respond immediately and to really have incredible volume and clarity. Tuning heads were designed as a signature model for me by George Graf, G-R-A-F, who lives in Canada, a German maker. And he has created a unique system of tuning whereby nothing touches when it's turning the cord out hole of the wood. And that means that the tuning process is completely silent, totally stable, and if, for example, I have to change tuning from a lower string, tuning D to uh, E or back and forth, it'll hold the tune. So these tuning heads uh, are really amazing because I've never seen anything else like it in terms of the accuracy, the control, and the silence of the process. The project that's coming up for me that I'm, I'm very excited about in 2012 is a documentary on my life and work that's been filmed over a period of three years. And the guests range from Martina Navratilova to Joan Baez to Corsi Vai to Santana and orchestras, conductors, uh, other musicians with whom I've collaborated, many, many composers like John Coriano, Christopher Roust, Ken Dunn, Joan Tower and others. So it will be a chance to really explore the literature that I've helped to nourish with these wonderful writers and artists and the new kinds of collaborations and projects and to see where that takes us in the future. So one of the things that um, is part of my entourage of stuff is this wonderful arm pad. It's made in Brazil by a company called Luba. And um, you can get it anywhere in the United States. It allows me to move very quickly left to right, right to left, so I can change colors. Uh, also to move in this direction, so if I'm playing fast scales, I'm not stuck in one place. I can really keep that fluidity. And of course, I always have a selection of trusty strings along, because if you break a string, you want to be ready. <clears throat> One of the little goodies. Oh, capo. Tuning device. And this case is actually from Tokyo. It's made out of styrofoam, so it's super, super lightweight. And that is a great arm saver when you're traveling. All kinds of stuff in here. Sandpaper, keep my nails smooth. <laughs> and this is really kind of cool. I started, um, I, I had a guy build me an amp that I can use to travel with. And one of the features of that amp is a little volume knob that I attach to it that sits by my chair so that when I'm playing and I need to change volume of what's coming out behind me, it's very easy to do so. So for example, if I'm playing something with orchestra, I might want 10 different volume settings in the course of the performance. So now I've sort of scaled that down. I don't even need to travel with the amp, which was a wireless system. I can just travel with this, this, hook it up to the speaker that the hall provides behind me, and this is connected either to a little uh, mini receiver board system on the stage, by just plugging it in into two direct boxes, or channeling it through their monitor insert of the control board. And it really makes a huge difference because I'm then in control of the sound, shaping the volume, and this is just a simple little nothing thing. Probably cost about $40. Designed for me.
and of course the footstool. Don't leave home without it.